ब्लूटूथ रेडी चले सर रेडी चार्जिंग बोलना है ना 945 तो 945 तो बोलना है ना 945 तो 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 
So I muted myself. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to extend the heartiest welcome to our chief guest, Dr. Mande, sir, as well as Aparav, sir, and all our NAAB family, uh, and uh, Dr. Lalji Singh's families, and all our virtual participants to the Dr. Lalji Singh's memorial lecture. Today, we have gathered to rejoice that Dr. Lalji Singh's memories. NAAB has been conducting this memorial lecture in honor of Dr. Lalji Singh every year since last year. Today's, uh, to, today's lecture, the second such lecture, honors the memory of Dr. Lalji Singh. So uh, we don't need a special introduction to Dr. Lalji Singh, most of you guys know, but for the students who are new joinees are here. So uh, he was one of the leading lights in uh, taking DNA fingerprinting. He is fondly called as the father of Indian DNA fingerprinting, Dr. Singh was an outstanding personality and excellent scientist an able administrator, an institutional builder, and a social worker, all rounder as a person, a single person who has all the, all the, uh, what I mean, all the characteristics. So he was one of the leading lights in DNA fingerprinting to mainstream in India, both in terms of research and for forensic applications. So uh, Dr. Singh's probe has been used in several high profile cases, including for, former prime minister, uh, Sri Rajiv Gandhi's assassination case, uh, Bennett Singh's murder case in Punjab, and Swami Premanand case of Kudikoti in Tamil Nadu, and Swami Shraddhanand case at Bengaluru. So uh, uh, he was also known for his DNA study for Indian population. The pathmaking work has been conducted on the tribes of Andaman and Nicobar Islands. The study found that the tribes were perhaps the first descendants of the people who moved out of Africa to India about 60 to 70,000 years ago and proposed the theory of southern route of migration via India through coastal routes. So that's what his major contribution to the Indian science. Uh, Dr. Singh, as I mentioned, he's, he's a founder of various institutes, particularly uh, CDFD, Center for DNA Fingerprinting, and uh, Lacoons, uh, this is one of the part of CCMB, as well as Genome Foundation aiming to diagnose and treat the genetic disorders affecting the Indian population, in particular the underprivileged people residing in the rural India. Uh, 
Um, Singh also served as a 25th Vice Chancellor to VHU, as well as he served as the Chairman of the Board of Governors and Indian Institute of Technology, VHU. He also served as a Director, as I mentioned, for both CCMB as well as CDFC. Especially, we were attached to Dr. Singh, Lalji Singh, because uh, he, we have the privilege to interact with him because he was our first SAC chairman. Uh, we are really lucky to have him in our scientific board and getting all the science-related comments. We are, we are really privileged. Uh, towards the awards and fellowships, Dr. Singh holds fellowship and awards from several Indian and foreign academies. Those include the highest uh, honor, for, uh, particularly Padma Shri, in recognition of his contribution in Indian science and technology. Uh, also, he has, uh, he is the member of all Indian academies, uh, like uh, Indian, Indian Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences, Indian National Science Academy, Andhra Pradesh Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Agriculture Sciences. He also owns a bag, lot of awards also, such as Indian National Science Academy Medal for Young Scientists, Commonwealth Fellowship, CSR Technology Award, Renboxy Research Award, Goel Prize in Life Sciences, Vigyan Goro Award, Fiki Award. There are a lot to mention, and uh, including JC Bose also. So uh, without any further delay, so now I request our director, ma'am, our chief guest, uh, Dr. Mande, sir, to pay tribute to our first SAC chairman, as well as Nobel Indian scientist, pay the tribute. Thank you very much, sir. So I request all our students and our colleagues to stand and mourn for one minute while we are paying tribute to our great scientist, Dr. Lalji Singh. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I think as Dr. Prasad uh, has already introduced and told everything, I too join uh, him uh, in saying uh, thanks uh, to the speaker of uh, this morning, uh, Professor Shekhar Mandi, for uh, this is the second largest thing, as he said, but the first offline lecture. So it becomes very special for the house and for all of us. And Dr. Lalji Singh, as was told, was our first SAC chairperson. And a lot of scientific uh, his, uh, wisdom and knowledge, it was sh uh, shared and as was discussed uh, on other platforms also, that NIAB really uh, got benefited with that. In person, uh, uh, like I too uh, worked with uh, Dr. Lalji Singh at CCMB. Uh, when I was at Center of Biotechnology at NDDB, Mumbai, because he was working on buffalo embryo sexing. And this uh, makes me feel really more belonged when this day has come. And we have a speaker. So with all uh, humility, I invite uh, Professor Shekhar Mande to uh, please uh, deliver his largest memorial lecture. 
Sir, one minute. I'll introduce you all. Sir, one minute. I'll briefly finish it. That's fine, sir. Like, a lot of young students are there. Let them know your achievements. I've been in the selection committee of almost everyone. Okay, sir. I'll, I'll, I'll let me. I said I have been in the selection committee of almost all the faculty members, so. <laughs> including me. That's okay. <laughs> so not necessary to introduce them. So, this is the second lecture uh, okay. of publishing. On this model, okay. I mean, today we have a distinguished and great scientist, Dr. Aki Mande, who has uh, made the inordinate contribution to structural biology. So, if some of most of the people you want to know about uh, this uh, test, Lectin, just a peanut lectin. If someone knows which is already there at Hyderabad Central University as an image, you can see that's what is his first crystal. He's a crystallographer who came up with first crystal in India. So you are taking a talk away. I'm going to talk about my lectin structure. So, you're <laughs> so let's start. So thanks very much for the uh, introduction and inviting me for the Lajit Singh Memorial Lecture. Uh, my own uh, remembrances of Lajit Singh are uh, interesting. So I was looking for a job in India, and when I applied to CCMB, uh, my first uh, reply was almost within 48 hours, very enthusiastic reply, as much before Lalji Singh, that please come visit us for three days, we are very interested in looking at you and everything. And uh, eventually when I was planning my visit to India to go to multiple institutes, by then when I wrote to CCMB that I am visiting, I get second reply saying that we have taken a conscious decision not to start structural biology in CCMB. And this was in 1995, and I felt that if an institute like CCMB says this, I think it's a very, very regressive leadership. I don't think institutes, modern institutes, can take a stand saying that we don't want to get into an area which already was promising to be something uh, which was going to change the face of biology than what we used to believe. And so, uh, and then of course uh, the things happened. I didn't come here, and then when I was moving out of Chandigarh, once again I wrote to CCMB. But this time, the leadership had changed. Laji was in position. And uh, the response was more than enthusiastic. Then I did actually come visit CCMB, also made an offer. Unfortunately, I mean, between CCMB and CDFD, I decided to join uh, CDFD, not CCMB then. But nonetheless, I mean, Laji had taken a call that he was going to get into the area which cannot be afforded not to get into. And you know, I mean, how structural biology has transformed CCMB today. CCMB had actually become very stagnated with a lot of old people, some of whom actually moved out thankfully to other places. But uh, uh, starting sexual biology did help CCMB in getting into newer areas. But Lalji also started infection biology in CCMB. So CCMB somehow was very odd at that time. I felt, I mean, there's not a hallmark of good leadership saying that we don't want to get into infection biology, we want to do basic biology. As if people who work on infections don't do basic biology, you know. And in fact, uh, a lot of people who come here, many of our good friends, uh, they say that India has so many fantastic problems lying around, especially with the kind of infection that exist here, which are nowhere in the world. The biology behind them is going to be extraordinarily fascinating. I mean, you are someone like Venki Ramakrishnan, he will say that why are people running after the same thing that the Western people are doing? India has so many problems which have fascinating biology behind that. And uh, 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 Laji actually took a bold step to start infection biology, getting breaking away from what CCMB used to think before that, and it was actually a very good idea, I believe. And Laji, in fact, had a dream of making a BSL-4 facility in Hyderabad. Unfortunately, by the time money came, and before the construction could begin, Laji had finished his term, and the BSL-4 then never eventually came. But the, the scene of Hyderabad the infection biology would have been completely different had he continued for another term. I mean, he was very far-sighted in that particular respect. I thought I will just share with you uh, these two things. Uh, this is the talk that I have uh, chosen to give today about the atomic view enhanced our understanding of biology. I gave an extempore uh, in CCMB about a month ago. Uh, when we were look, uh, looking at their cryom facility, we were commissioning the cryom facility of CCMB. And then uh, many people came and told me that why don't you actually develop into a full talk and give it. So I did uh, try to give this particular talk 
about the 10 days ago in pune there was the ullaswag memorial lecture ullaswag was the founder director of nccs pune and i thought i would rather repeat that once again here with bit more additions in the thing what we do so what i want to start and is a very popular talk it's not a very technical talk so uh, but nonetheless uh, many of our students in msc and all have not been exposed to the kind of thing that structural biology has helped in gaining deeper understanding of biology you know? i mean in biochemistry textbooks and all you will invariably see uh, how structures have helped in understanding uh, mechanistic biology but some of that is not taught in our courses so i thought i will start from there and what i want to start really from is this particular figure and we'll spend some time on this particular figure if you look at the dimensions in biology okay length dimensions particularly right uh, uh, time dimensions we'll talk a little later but length dimensions if you look at this is something like a nanometer that is 10 to the power minus 9 this is a micrometer that is 10 to the power minus 6 and somewhere here is millimeter at this particular point uh, where my pointer is this 10 to the power minus 3 there the sizes of different thing in biology and once again if you traverse this much distance on this side of the screen somewhere here will be a meter right so we are actually expanding uh, the, 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 the thousand fold more every time now when biology essentially started and if you can assume let us say sometimes say when darwin undertook his journey it was more like observing around and how different organisms behave how do they grow how do they divide Uh, how do they die how do they metabolize so all of it actually together is what essentially constituted understanding of biological processes right and by observation when we are observing different things whether be it plant insects animal and everything we are talking of the dimension of roughly about a meter right and in our uh, the length of all these organisms would be of the order of a meter or 2 or 3 meters or something or some of them could be 0.1 meter so something like that so we are talking of dimensions and we are here but very soon people realize that to understand such large organisms it actually becomes difficult to understand all the things that i talked just now how do we metabolize how do we divide what happens if we lose control over our division processes and all so to understand that we have to have model organisms right i mean the, the people like max delbruck and all uh, who shifted from physics who was a quantum physicist moved into biology Uh, said that we must have model organisms in biology that will allow us to address fundamental problems of biology and that already brings us to the millimeter then some way here so right? i mean this is a millimeter roughly at this particular right end of this thing and then we started working on organisms like drosophila and things like that so these organisms are tiny uh, they can still be observed at times through microscope but nonetheless we can observe them and try to understand how they actually behave and uh, that thing other like i mean if you deprive them of food what happens if you create mutants by some means how do these mutants behave because we can map the mutations and all and that enormously help biology to gain understanding of the fundamental processes right at the organism level so drosophila actually turned out to be very very good but yet drosophila was a multi cellular organism and we wanted to have a even better handle in trying to understand that at more sub cellular level or something like that and then we move to organisms like yeast or e coli which already brings us one scale down about 10 to the power 3 or 1000 fold smaller organisms right i mean organisms which are of the length of micrometers or something you know e coli typically is a rod shape uh, about 2 micron length is what e coli is you know so it already brings us to a scale which is now in microns you know so now we cannot see any more with a naked eye but we need we do need microscopes to study this kind of organism and these are unicellular organisms whether it be saccharomyces or whether it be e coli and all they are all unicellular organisms but yet we can do a lot of manipulations genetic manipulations and try to understand whether we can generalize what we learn from these organisms to a much larger scale so when we say larger scale we always are worried about this particular scale here of the order of meters you know i mean organisms like human beings animals plants the biosphere is what we actually eventually want to understand in biology but by choosing model organisms and all we already at a scale which is much much smaller right so micron size or something like that so very soon people realized that even organism like e coli is an extremely complex organism 
a large number of molecules lipids carbohydrates dna proteins and what not all different kinds of metabolites and the way these molecules interact with each other eventually would define the way this single cellular organisms would respond to either external stimulus or division or growth or metabolism or whatever so we must understand how these different molecules actually start talking with each other in these even smaller organisms so we are already at the molecular level you know in the 1950s much after the biological field really started if you say from darwin about 100 years later we started saying that we have to understand organisms at the molecular level and that's really the birth of molecular biology about that particular point of time and for these of course we are going into a little bit the lower scale which now would not be even accessible to microscopes you know so we had to now start developing techniques that even microscope would not work at that particular stage and uh, we are already working about even 1000 fold less in dimensions so this is a micrometer micron and this is nanometer about roughly 1000 times smaller than that and that's where actually we are coming at the atomic level and then we started addressing issues at the atomic level right? like water molecule glucose proteins proteins are about tens of nanometers uh, long something like that so in the scale now we are already at a nanometer scale right so it's uh, much smaller but yet we want to understand at this particular scale with the hope that if we understand molecules it would tell us how biology eventually evolves you know different processes in biology how we can understand them better for example if we talk of water molecule alone you know i mean it's a very fascinating molecule of life about 70% of our all our cells are made up of water and uh, absolutely fascinating there would be no life without water uh, and that's a thing that is often talked in the textbooks right and there are many many different properties of water that physicists and chemists are still trying to understand we don't fully understand entire thing about water but all life that we talk about for example our cells inside the cell is very rich with water and because we don't want to lose water we generate a very strong hydrophobic wall around the cells the membrane is extremely hydrophobic right so water should not be lost easily from the inside from the cytoplasm to outside and the hydrophobicity actually then defines this is water heating property of membranes and that is essentially for water to prevent going from inside to outside or outside to inside but all life revolves around water right without water there would be no life and uh, the, the, the living systems make a very beautiful use of water in almost everything that you can think of all right for example water has a very high heat of vaporization now this is a chemical property of water there is the amount of heat it can absorb to convert from ice to liquid water or from liquid to vapor is enormous it can absorb lot of heat while converting from one physical form into another all right now all organisms make use of this particular water the property of water for example if we go and play a game of tennis or something or if we go and jog we start start sweating right or if you have fever you take crocin and you start sweating why do you think you start sweating the sweat is a natural mechanism by which water appears on the surface of our skin it evaporates and when it evaporates it evaporates a large heat of vaporization that has gone into it so it immediately it offers a cooling system to the body so any time when we sweat the sweat essentially is to release the heat from the body right and that's why when we do a rigorous exercise and we sweat the body's temperature goes up and to cool down the natural mechanism would be to release water from the body so that that heat can be released and then we can actually once again cool down to that temperature now like like this there are many many different properties of water and get this we can go on talking about we can have one full picture on water alone but let us start moving a little bit ahead time we will not talk at this moment where time scales also very fascinating that uh, at what time scales things different happen but uh, we'll talk about time some other day but let us actually restrict ourselves to this uh, on today's day right i mean the scale of length and let us see how actually we can start understanding things at uh, the molecular level now at the molecular level as i said uh, 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 because we started distinctly moving to started moving in 1950s towards molecular level we had to evolve techniques that would allow us to understand the molecules and uh, one of the first persons who recognized that understanding molecules and 
the juxtaposition of atoms, relative juxtaposition of atoms in the molecule is going to have a profound effect on the understanding of chemical, physical, and biological processes was none other than Linus Pauling. Okay? And this is taken from Linus Pauling's Nobel lecture in 1954. And let me read a quote to you. What Pauling says is that we may, I believe, anticipate that the chemist of the future who is interested in the structures of proteins, nucleic acids, polysaccharides, and other complex substances with higher molecular weights will come to rely upon a new structural chemistry involving precise geometrical relationships among the atoms in the molecules and the rigorous applications of the new structural principles. And that great progress will be made through this technique in the attack by chemical methods on the problems of biology and medicine." Unquote. I don't think anyone would have predicted, even Pauling, what he actually said at that time, would not have believed if he had lived on to see the progress that this statement has made today. I mean, about uh, uh, 70 years since, biology has progressed enormously because of the evolution of entirely what Pauling was saying, the geometrical relationships among atoms in the molecules. And I'm going to give you some examples of this to you. And then I will try to convince you that how much it has actually led to the understanding of basic biological principles using these techniques. And I start, I don't want to start from the 1950s. I want to pick up the thread from my PhD days. Uh, I did my PhD as uh, set on peanut lectin. And uh, uh, it was the first protein structure that was being solved in India by x crystallography. I will not go into the details of the technique and all. But in x crystallography, one has to collect what is called as the diffraction data, which I used to do on photographic plates, such as this, what I've shown you here. And typically, one diffraction photograph would be collected from one crystal over a period of about 24 hours. I mean, I used to spend 24 hours exposing X-ray films uh, to the diffraction from the crystal, the crystal we had grown in the lab, and we collected data. And I took about a year to finish the complete data collection. That I mean, is a crystal. And we had to expose the crystal to X-rays in many different orientations, which we did. And that took about a year. I mean, one one photograph would take about 24 hours, but uh, one year was actually was taken. You will not believe, on today's date, when we collect crystallographic data, my students, they send crystals from Pune to synchrotron. They sit on a computer in Pune, and they collect the data in 10 seconds. You know, so in 1985, when we collected data, it took about one year. On today's date, we can do that in 10 seconds. So, I mean, that's the progress that what we have made. And we'll actually tell you how it happened. Also, when we solved the structure in 1991, we had to contour something called electron density maps. These are hand contoured by me with my own hands. The maps, what you show here, I show here, is electron dense region here, which is the protein, peanut lectin, and electron poor region here, which is the solvent in the crystal. And this electron density map was eventually used to interpret the structure. And this is a structure that I'm very proud. And I thank University of Hyderabad to have displayed a structure in their gallery. So this is a peanut lectin structure. There is the first structure that was solved in the country and also formed my uh, PhD thesis at that particular point of time. It showed for the first time, we'll not go into the details, what we call as an open bottom research. So Anil bottom researcher is what we called as open bottom researcher then. We published a paper then in PNAs uh, after three years of going around with different high level journals. But nonetheless, I mean, thankfully, it was published in PNAs data. Now, as I said, we collected data over a period of one year. Today, we collect data in 10 seconds. You know? Solving structure these days can be done within 24 hours, what I took about seven years then. You know, when I did seven years to solve the entire structure, today we can solve the structure within a day or two if uh, the conditions are favorable. And all that has been possible because of multiple things. Number one, we have now improved X-ray sources. In our times, we had the sealed tubes. Then came the rotating anodes, both in the lab. But now we have these gigantic machines called synchrotrons, where we send our crystals. And they're very, very powerful. They're about a million times powerful than what we used to use uh, the lab sources and all. We have better X-ray detectors. I collected data on photographic films, which I had to go and develop in dark rooms. And those of you who have used that one would know the nuances of how to develop photographic films and how to fix them and so on and so forth. It's a different art altogether. 
But by the time I was finishing my PhD and I was doing my postdoc in early 1990s, imaging plates had already made uh, uh, into the market. Imaging plate essentially, you put a plate, you scan it after collecting the data, then you expose to white light, the plate gets erased, and the same plate can be used once again. So you can reuse the plate once again. So and you can do it multiple times, billions of times you can do that. But of course, today what we have are modern detectors, which are even more powerful than the imaging plates. The higher computing power. I showed you that I contoured the data, uh, contoured uh, the electron density map with my hand. All these contours are drawn by my hand. But today we don't have to contour this. I just feed the map on a computer screen, even on my mobile, and I can see the entire contours made there. So computers have made the enormous difference uh, since then. I mean, what used to be, I mean, this entire room full of computer that what we had in IIC Bangalore, this big a room, and this big a room had a computer. And that computer, DEC 1090 system, with a very god for second operating system, what was called then TOPS 10, right? this is mid 1980s. More computing power is there today on my mobile than that entire room full of computers then. So uh, the computers have made, of course, enormous uh, progress since then. But of course, computer graphics are made. And by the time I was doing my postdoc, also some other techniques have started emerging, like freezing the crystals under nitrogen. And automation of crystallizations, and as I said, collection of data remotely. That is, you send a crystal to synchrotron and start doing that. Now, all of these have helped structural biology to grow phenomenally over the years. And when it started happening, the structural biology became more and more ambitious, and more and more fundamental problems of biology, which was not otherwise were understood very well, we started addressing them one by one. And I want to give a few examples of this in the next few slides. In the next about 20 minutes or so, we will spend time on discussing different examples in biology, how structures have helped in getting understanding fundamental mechanisms in biology. Now, this is a structure from mid 1980s. You know, The problem was, we know that body generates large number of antibodies against any antigen. Right? I mean, we know that the antibody diversity that we can generate is really large. But how do antibodies actually generate that kind of an affinity to bind to an antigen? Now, that always has been a question that was not very well understood. And Amzell's group in Paris was able to actually crystallize an antibody with an antigen. In this case, this is the antibody and this is the antigen. What had been shown about 10 years before, of course, VDJ recombination and all had been kind of proven about 10 years before these people started doing the structure. But what remarkably they found is that the entire diversity that what we have in antibodies essentially lies into three loops of this structure. The ones that are shown in red here are the ones which are the entire diversity that can come. So the enormous diversity that the body has in generating antibodies of different kinds all comes only because of these three loops. In fact, six loops, three coming from the light chain and three coming from the heavy chain. And what they showed is that the affinity to bind to antigen this was in mid 1980s comes because there's a large area that is buried in the interface between the antibody and the antigen. This is the lesser same antigen then, but we of course understand much more. Now, just like antibodies, we also know that body also has another arm of the immune system. And the problem was how the other arm functions. I mean, how's the uh, antigen presented by in the cell mediated immunity. And there, of course, the MHCs present wide variety of antigens to the T cell receptors. And the T cell receptors have higher affinity to bind to the peptides and so on and so forth. But once again, the problem was contrary. In this case, diversity comes not because of specific binding to the antigen. Diversity comes because of the non-specific binding to the antigen by MHCs. And the MHC structures was once again, the peptide structure was kind of known like this. That MHC class one, you have an alpha chain and a beta two microglobulin while MSC class two has an alpha and beta two chain, something like this. And what was known by then was that MSC class one would bind to a peptide which is roughly about nine residues long, uh, nine amino acids, while class two would bind to a much longer peptides. But then affinity to binding to the MSC peptide complex would come from the T cell receptor. And look at this. When the T cell receptor structure became available in the early 1990s, exactly the same principle that antibodies did. You know, the diversity in three loops, or rather six loops, three from heavy chain, three from the light chain. 
exactly identical principle and in fact the structure of t cell receptor very much resembles that of an antibody look at this is exactly the same principle that biology has used in generating diversity of the t cell receptor structure and the same six loops that we talked about in the antibody structures are here and diversity in t cell receptor structures would actually come up because of diversity in this and the structure also told of mhc why there is a restriction of nine uh, and why class 2 has much more and all the beautiful structure at the time jack, jack strominger and don wiley together saw this structure the series of structures it was very beautiful to see and in fact what also they did was something called super antigen which i am not showing you here it does not bind inside this particular group but rather binds outside and then recruits t cell antigen t cell receptor somewhere there so immunology now had been actually started people have started addressing questions about immunology very deeply like how do viruses enter the cells how does body actually react to them how does body really create these peptides either in the phagolysosomes or in the cytosol so these peptides get transferred to the mhc how does the mhc eventually go and present it to the t cell receptor and so on so forth all these questions started to be addressing one after another after this you know donnelly's group did some phenomenal work at that particular point of time by then this mid 1990s the other problems that also people thought that we should start addressing you know i mean i'm just giving you some random examples and one of the major problems was about transcription initiation in eukaryotes the way transcription is initiated is essentially by tata box recognition first then recruitment recruitment of tata associated factors and eventually rna pol2 comes and sits on that and the transcription begins i mean that's how we read in the textbooks right but how would that happen and uh, christy worley and paul sigler together solved the structure of the tata box binding protein in the first instance something like this this is the dimer of uh, tbp and then they solved the structure with the cognate tata box dna which is actually shown here and beautiful it explained so many things in the one go you know the dna does not pass through straight like what we think in our shoe here there would be a single dna molecule that can go in and the dimensions of this our shoe are perfect to accommodate the single dna molecule that can go through the plane here but no the dna comes in this direction in the vertical direction bends goes in the direction of a perpendicular to the paper and comes out in a perpendicular direction again the severe bend of the dna and then it was interpreted in the form that eventually when rna pol2 comes and binds on this entire mega complex at that time where it would start transcription from that dna sequence should not be very far away from where the tbp has bound if a single dna had bound straight through this molecule that side would have been very far away but the bending of the dna allows rna pol2 to reach its cognate site to start transcription very easily from here and it's actually very beautiful and tata box binding protein how the bending actually occurs also was shown because of the intercalation of certain residues in the dna molecule the stabilization of the phosphates which are in yellow and red by the series of species and arginines in the tata box and all is beautifully actually illustrated at a particular point of time and soon enough of course the structure of rna pol2 also became available you know i mean the data structure i mean this is much later but uh, early 2000s or something when the structure became available and in fact uh, we had rajan korban onberg uh, visiting hyderabad then in early 2000s just before he won his nobel prize and he presented the structure beautiful structure in uh, iict i remember in the auditorium early 2000s or something just before the nobel prize was announced that he came and presented such a beautiful and it the entire rna polymerase structure here showed how the mega complex assembles at the initiation site how does it actually recognize the first sequence the initiation how does it elongate and eventually how does it stop transcription all of it actually is a textbook example today how rna polymerase transcribes today is now a part of all the biochemistry textbooks and thanks to all the structures that we saw till about early 2000s of rna polymerase tata box binding protein tf and so on and so forth and every time i am giving example i want to assure you that every time the textbooks were being rewritten what was understood before that and what is understood after that every time the biochemistry textbooks were being rewritten and they are being rewritten practically every 2 years you know as we are starting gaining understanding of different processes the textbooks were being rewritten all over again and this is one of the prime examples 
of that particular estate i want to give a second a very good example is the example of many of you know is all our cells carry dna right i mean human cells so we have about 10 to the power 12 10 to the power 13 cells in our body each cell carries a dna right if you take that dna roughly about 3.3 giga bases and elongate and end join to uh, end to end join and elongate it that dna is roughly about 1 meter long you know i mean the, every cell of our body has a dna which is 1 meter long all right believe it or not the length of the dna would be 1 meter now 10 to the power 9 cells in the body or 10 to the power 12 cells in the body right so total length of dna would be 10 to the power 12 meters right the total dna that is there in our body in the length scale but this dna of course is compact right because if you don't compact it it will not be accommodated in the cells that also in the nucleus and the way it is compacted it was known that dna is compacted by histones the histone octama something like this it has about 147 base pairs that are compacted by one single octamer something like this and when it is compacted it was known that histones really don't interact in a sequence specific manner with the dna you know when the histones if they start interacting with the sequence specific manner they would bind only certain segments of dna so it's therefore important that they don't recognize any of the bases in the dna so the histone side chains all the amino acid side chains of the histone octamer they don't really interact with the dna directly with the bases and that is to avoid sequence specific recognition but nonetheless the basic residues the lysines and arginines do indeed interact with the dna but mostly with the phosphodiester backbone of the dna and that's how the entire complex is stabilized right the lysines and the arginines if they interact with the phosphates which are negatively charged then you will get a stability to the complex but the question comes that for transcription you will need to make the dna naked at that time it has to unwind from histones right when the transcription starts the dna has to be naked how would that happen if the lysines and arginines are interacting strongly with the phosphate how would that happen and what you see here are essentially some of the histone tails which are protruding out of the entire histone complex so in, in this case this white one the gray one is the dna and the colored ones are different histones is to a is to b and so on and so forth and uh, they are actually protruding out and essentially these are the lysines and arginines which interact with the phosphodiester backbone of the dna so all the epigenesis will tell you that histones need to be modified before transcription begins right and that is to make the dna naked and the modification that would take place are those of the lysines and arginines and lysines and arginines if they get methylated or acetylated you can imagine they would lose charge lysines and arginines are positively charged upon methylation they would lose the charge and therefore the strength of interaction between the histone and the dna would reduce and automatically the dna would fall off from this complex it would become naked and then it would become available for starting transcription fantastic you know i mean the entire mechanism of how transcription would begin on a naked dna became very clear at this particular point of time once again this is about early 2000 uh, erling kruger uh, uh, in the lab of tim richmond she actually solved the structure and it was beautiful i mean entire mechanism of how dna is compacted and all became available but as we are moving along in the mid 80s one of the problem that was also with us that how do membrane proteins actually whether we'll be able to ever look at membrane proteins at the atomic uh, uh, resolution and the first one that was solved membrane protein structure was that of the photosynthetic reaction center this is a very very complex molecule about four or five different polypeptides in this multiple cofactors so the structure was solved by robert huber hans eisenhower and hartmut michel in uh, max planck and uh, what hartmut michel showed that membrane proteins can be solubilized in uh, uh, detergents and if you do that uh, you can actually get handle to do this and once again the structure showed very well that how light energy in terms of photons when it is incident on a photosynthetic reaction center through a series of steps can be converted into electrons at this particular point of time so the photoelectric energy being converted into electrical signal inside the cell once again would become apparent but more fundamental problems were waiting right how do you actually think uh, transport things across membranes in the beginning of my talk i told you I told you about water that water does not diffuse easily through the membranes not in any other thing 
none of the metabolites can easily diffuse through the membrane for everything you need a transporter including sodium and potassium ions this is the first problem now sodium and potassium ions they maintain polarity in the cells they maintain the cell volume and shape and all of that right so you need actually cell the, the concentration of potassium and sodium has to be perfect inside the cell it cannot be more it cannot be less you know but how would you actually transport that into the cells that is a major fundamental problem that was being addressed at a particular point of time and uh, 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 as the, the, you know that this is the bilayer membrane bilayer is roughly about uh, 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 three to four nanometers about 30 to 40 angstroms thick and uh, the, the, barrier, the energy barrier for transport would be maximum here as i said the uh, membranes are highly hydrophobic inside and uh, ions are charged and therefore for any ion to pass through the membrane if you plot the energy diagram that would be highest in the center somewhere here and therefore it would be important in biological systems to lower this barrier the energy barrier has to be lowered at the center of the membrane and how would biological systems do that the very elegant mechanism you know so all the transporters what i'm showing you here is a structure of a potassium transporter the kcsa channel from streptomyces lepidans this structure was solved in late 1990s by rod mckinnon and uh, uh, in the structure what he showed to lower the barrier because it's potassium you would need a negative charge towards the center of the membrane and a negative charge can be given by the alpha helices in protein something like this in which the carboxyl terminal of alpha helices are pointing towards the center of the membrane as you see here very clearly this alpha helix and this alpha helix together in fact there are four of them in this particular structure they point right to the center of the membrane right the four alpha helices pointing right there and that accumulates negative charge towards here inside a protein body of course and that actually allows the barrier to be lowered. The potassium ions, they enter the channel, they are stabilized here, and then by diffusion, they go into the cell. Now, the question that were being asked at that time, that the rate of transfer of potassium ions is of the order of about 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 ions per second. That's actually as good as the diffusion rate. How does that happen? Number one. Number two, potassium channel does not transport sodium and sodium channel does not transport potassium how do you get that specificity and number three how does the cell decide at what time or point of time how does the cell regulate the transport of ions in and out you know, the regulatory mechanism has to be there because you cannot transfer too many you cannot transfer too less you know and from the structure everything became very clear first of all the rate actually becomes very high because at this funnel like structure there are a large number of negative residues outside the membrane on the protein. They attract ions from outside here. There's an accumulation of all the ions here. They are dehydrated and they enter the channel here. They're exactly stabilized by the geometry, by the carbonyl oxygens of the peptides here. So you see here a potassium ion being stabilized by the carbonyl oxygens. The geometry is such that the difference between a sodium ion and potassium ion Potassium is slightly larger than the sodium ion by something like 0.1 nanometers, right? I mean, the, the, the ionic radius is very, very small. So we are looking at a nanometer scale, but yet the geometry is such that only one of them could be stabilized. Here. So if it's a potassium channel, it would be potassium geometry. If it's a sodium channel, it would be a sodium geometry. And the placement of carbonyl oxygen is such that precisely that kind of geometry would be generated in the channel structure. And because of dehydration and all, they enter here. And then there will be a repulsion between different potassium ions. And by simple repulsion, they would be popped inside at that particular site. At this site, they are stabilized by the alpha helices. It gets hydrated again because it actually opens up inside the cell. And by diffusion now, it can come inside the cell. There will be gated mechanisms. The gating actually would happen somewhere here. The cells actually would regulate when they want to actually have ions inside or not would be actually gated somewhere here. So all the three problems that I showed you, that I told you earlier, that the rate of uh, transport of ions, why precisely uh, the, the, the so much precision about selectivity of the filter, and why the gating mechanism happens, once again actually became very clear when the structure became available. And of course, this is taken from the Nobel Prize of Rod McKinnon. And this is a 
recurring summary of all the channels that actually are there ion channels in biology for example this chloride channel chloride is negative and you just reverse the pole here instead of having negatively charged uh, alkalis pointing to the center we have no positively charged alkalis pointing to the center same principle once again right so the principles are recurring once again as we saw in the antibody structures and t cell receptors similar principles are used in biology in stabilizing structures and so on and so forth and trying to actually define how they can transport this number some fantastic work i want to give this very 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 fine example of atp motor i mean so and i said once again trust me every time these structures were solved all of them made into biochemistry textbooks in no time and the potassium ion channel structure or the mhcs and all within a year of them the biochemistry structure the striers and all those things were being rewritten and they would include now the new understanding of the principles by that so this is phenomenal structure absolutely phenomenal now this is one of the most complex reactions that is generating the atp you know I mean all of us know that atp what is the importance of atp how do you generate atp in the world now it was known that uh, for generating atp you would need to transport some protons right? i mean this hypothesis had been proposed i think by michel if i am not wrong uh, about 20 years before uh, for this thing and with the transport of protons uh, it would be coupled and atp would be formed in the enzyme somewhere now this is the enzyme there are six of you here alpha beta alpha beta alpha beta so uh, alpha 2 beta 2 alpha uh, alpha beta 3 uh, is the structure somewhere here there are 10 or 12 c subunits which actually span the membrane all right and the proton the, 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 the proton would be transported across the membrane from somewhere here there is a shaft that connects from the c subunits to the alpha beta subunits somewhere here all right now what the japanese group did something fantastic they first actually attach an actin somewhere here long actin they attach fluorescent probes to that all right they generated artificial membranes and then they made sure that there is a proton transport here the moment proton transport was there on a microscopic slide under a normal optical microscope they saw that the fluorescent probe was actually rotating like okay. this yes, beautiful this entire alpha beta 3 uh, assembly was rotating after they started actually passing protons this particular channel so that came the proof of principle that indeed protons actually rotate this subunit Right, so it's the ATP motor now. Now, how does that happen? That happens is a very beautiful principle. As all of you know, aspartic acid is a carboxylic side chain, right? In the ionic form, it is COO minus. In the non-ionic form, it is COOH. When it is COO, it has a negative charge. In COOH, the negative charge is gone, right? Now, negative charge does not like to interact with the membrane, right? But COOH will have no difficulty in interacting with the membrane. All right. and that's precisely what happens there is a very crucial aspartic acid right in the center here when it is protonated by the proton that is being transported it becomes cooh and that aspartic acid actually then faces the membrane the torque that it generates rotates the subunit if there are 10 subunits by about 36 degrees the torque generated by that particular transport of proton and protonating the carboxylic acid here generate uh, rotates the c subunit by 36 degrees so that you need 10 protons to pass through the membrane for entire 360 degree rotation all right now as i said every time there is a rotation here there is a shaft that couples that rotation somewhere here so generating atp actually you need energy right so you have adp and pi in the active site that would be captured in the active site somewhere here and the energy that is generated through the rotation process eventually would join the atp and pi adp and pi and that's how the atp would eventually be formed you know the fantastic structural principles that came out of this there was of course solved by john walker several years ago and once again this quotation is taken from his nobel lecture uh, i think it's late 1990s if i'm not wrong he says that throughout our endeavors we have been motivated by the expectation that the detailed knowledge of f0 fp1 atp synthesis structure would lead to a better understanding of how atp is made and he would not be to be anything wrong if looking at the structure and the way he has described the structure in the entire papers and all that fantastic how atp actually would be formed and how energy would go in in the formation of atp itself you know it's really very very good and many many other structures actually that started coming in little later and i don't want to actually i don't have time to go into the large number of structures that have come in after that of the transporters you know whether 
a leucine transporter, for example, the transporter is in a position like this, leucine binds here, and then it just flips. So that leucine which is bound here automatically goes in. So it just keeps flipping like this throughout the entire transport process. And some of the proteinergic receptors where the ligand would bind here, open up the channel and allow uh, things to be transported across. And so we are good. Now, while we are talking of the 1990s, the most awaited structures were, of course, those of ribosomes. Because ribosomes are far more complex than anything else that we knew then. You know, I mean, so the most complex machinery in biology would be that of ribosomes, right? It has to read a signal from the messenger RNA. It has to bring the proper cognate tRNA into the system. Then the tRNA, whatever it is charged with the amino acids, has to go to the active site. And the chain which is being elongated, the polypeptide chain, it has to add that amino acid to this. One of the most complex mechanisms that would be there is actually there in the ribosome machinery. By far, one of the most complex mechanisms. Now, ribosomes had been crystallized by 1980s by Ada Yunath and her group in Israel. But they were quite elusive for the structures because we did not have powerful X-ray machines, we did not have powerful detectors, and we did not have powerful computers. But by mid 1990s, it became apparent that uh, the synchrotrons had become available, the imaging plates had become available, and the computers had become available. And then there was like a mad rush on the ribosome structures. So five or six groups simultaneously published ribosome structures, six groups simultaneously in the same week. Some came in nature, some came in cell, and some came in uh, science. I mean, all of them on the cover, of course, in each of the journals carried on the cover. The 50th ribosome structure was solved by Tom Stites group as this big, huge RNA and the color that you see are all proteins in this case. The 30th ribosome structure was solved by Vicky and Adoyana independently. Once again, you see here the color thing is RNA and the gray things are proteins here. Very complex assembly, you know, about 25 odd proteins, two RNAs all coming together. And the 70th structure, of course, was solved by Harry Noller in the same week, that also came in science. So all these actually came together, this structure, phenomenal. All of it actually talked about the mechanism of each of the things that we talked about. But one of the best realizations that actually came after the structures were solved, and that was the biggest surprise then, was that ribosomes are ribozymes. You know, you have heard of ribozymes, right? RNA acting as enzymes is a ribozyme, right? There is no protein molecule here. And Tom's site such a clearly elongated, that it clearly showed that at the elongation site here, this is the elongation site of the ribosome. This is where all the action is taking place of adding an amino acid to the already elongating protein chain. You don't see a single protein in the vicinity of this. This is all RNA. Right? And that confirmed the belief that ribosomes are really ribozymes. You don't need a protein to mediate active activate uh, to, to, to act as an activator of the enzymatic reaction. So it's a ribozyme. And then, of course, there's a big exit tunnel that you know that I mean, elongating polypeptide would be protected, roughly about 10 to 20 amino acid residues in the elongation. Eventually, Venki solved the structure with many antibiotics. They solved the structures with uh, tRNAs bound to the site. There's mRNA, eventually, they found it was bound somewhere here, and so on. So on. And the entire field actually literally exploded beyond that particular point of time. And in fact, many of you would remember. About five years before he got a Nobel Prize, he had come to Hyderabad and he gave talks both in CCMB and CDFD at that particular point of time. He spent three, four days with all of us here and he had actually given these talks about the ribosome and very, very exciting. The entire complex machinery of ribosomes, how it functions, you know, how it reads the mRNA, how the tRNA is brought to the site, active site, how the tRNA actually reads the cognate anticodon here and docks itself the correct amino acid into the uh, active site of peptide elongation somewhere here. How does the elongation change actually really take place? How does the peptidyl transferase activity really take place here? How does the elongated uh, peptide step one by one residue outside the active site? Every time the amino acid is bound, it goes to the next site. It goes to the next site. All these became apparent from the different structures that multiple people had solved at that particular point of view. Beautiful. And once again, as I said, once again, textbooks now had a new chapter on trying to understand how ribosomes really function. You know, this is, uh, the ribosome first structure came, I think, around 2000, like about five to six angstroms. But uh, the 10 years later, they had multiple structures which improved the resolution. And today, of course, 
large number of revenue structures are there in the data bank. Now, with this, all the development that we are talking of that was happening around the world, and ribosomes actually come almost up to 2010, what I told you about. The world was now poised for next revolution. That now can we be after conquering ribosomes? Can we now actually start thinking of much, much more complex processes? And for doing those complex processes, there was a need that we develop even better techniques than crystallography alone, techniques which would allow us to address much more complex problems. Or can we develop more computational methods of even predicting structures? So these are the challenges that actually they started in the last about 10 years or so. And therefore, when the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic came about three years ago, it was very apparent that very soon, most people would have solved the structures of all the proteins of SARS-CoV-2, and an understanding would be developed how the virus actually enters into the cell. And then uh, it, it, it is so beautiful, all of this, is that you have the spike protein. The spike protein actually binds the receptor binding domain of that, binds to the ACE receptor. And the structures of these were solved literally within two months of having sequenced the genome of SARS-CoV-2 itself. You know, I mean, the first genome sequence became available, I think, on 7th January 2020. You know, and within two or three months, the structures of all of these had started rolling out. What is the structure of the spike protein? How does it bind to the ACE2 receptor? If there are mutations here, what would happen in the receptor binding domain of the spike protein? And so on and so forth. And in fact, how would antibody neutralizing antibodies would bind it? So there's a structure of the neutralizing antibodies, which is bound to the spike protein, and that would prevent its binding to the ACE2 receptor. So all of these actually came out in no time, literally. And if there are mutations in the binding sites here, which binds to the receptor, then what would happen? Whether it would bind more strongly or less strongly, or it would facilitate entry of SARS-CoV-2, and all of this actually is absolutely fascinating. And much of this was possible because we have started developing a technique called cryo-electron microscopy, single particle analysis. You know, that new technique that had come around the block that people had actually started moving away from crystallography. And uh, although very complicated, but nonetheless, a technique which can make all of this accessible, you know, in the, solving some of these problems accessible. And in fact, people had also started doing what is called as cryotan tomography. Now, tomography is just amazing. And that's the next revolution that is unfolding even as we speak today. So what people want to do now is that look at the entire cell, cell in its entity, and now starts asking questions where different molecules are placed and how they are behaving, how they are acting, what the action of these molecules on each other eventually is leading the cells into their phenotypic behavior and so on and so forth. And just to show you the photograph of the SARS-CoV-2, how it looks, look at this is a beautiful video that you will see here. Now we are actually doing Z sectioning and we are going through the section in this particular case. And what you see here is appearance of the particle here, the nucleic acid binding protein, nucleic acid protein here, the spike protein on the outside and is the membrane. The entire nucleic acid inside and contact is beautiful. The entire thing which actually section into this, it showed that how it would actually behave, how the things would be packaged inside the virus particle, as well as on the outside. On the surface, of course, you have the spike protein. And inside what you have is all the, the yellow ones, what you see is the nucleic acid inside. And each of these actually is very, very beautiful. Each of these so this is the spike protein, of course. And this is the receptor binding domain from the area. This is the S2 receptor domain. Let me see this. Now, I started my talk with the struggles that I had during my PhD time and how I collected data and all. And I want to end my talk once again by giving one example of uh, uh, what we have solved recently. And this time we have solved using cryotome microscopy, the structure of an enzyme called ribonucleotide mutase. Uh, this enzyme is a ternary complex of uh, uh, subunit called E, subunit called F, and subunit called I. And we have been able to actually use cryotron microscopy in this case to solve the structure. Now, as I said, to address more and more complex problems in biology, we have to resort to better and better techniques. And without cryotron microscopy, it would not have been possible for us to start addressing problems such as this. I mean, this is a very large complex, and I don't think we'll be ever, ever grow crystals of this for doing exit diffraction data for any of this. And uh, thankfully, the technique has now been very well developed. And uh, we are able to use the technique to address more and more complex problems. And as I said, 
the many, many, many complex problems that are waiting to be solved, waiting to be addressed. And I'm pretty sure that tomography and single particle analysis together would be eventually able to do that. So I want to end my talk with two different examples. I want to tell you that two important developments that have taken place, as I said, one is that of the development of Clareton microscopy single particle analysis. And that has been in progress for a long, long time. In fact, when I was doing a PhD itself, Richard Henderson's group in Cambridge were already working on bacterial rhodopsin. In the 1980s, they were working on bacterial rhodopsin from purple membranes, and they were trying to do actually 2D analysis of uh, these membranes then. But then the techniques had not very well developed. And in fact, biological sample is also destroyed by electron microscopes, and therefore they were not able to progress much further. But in came these two people, and particularly Dubouche. And Dubouche actually showed that if you vitrify the sample, so essentially you take the sample and flash freeze it so that the water does not form ice. Water is kind of in an amorphous form. And as long as this is very thin sample, so that the electrons don't interfere by the water molecules, we can do proper electron microscopy of these samples. And Joachim Fram, of course, actually developed large number of cryo techniques to solve the structures and so on and so forth. So together, these three gentlemen actually showed that this is a very, very powerful technique that has become available to us now to address much, much more complex problems in biology. And I have not given you examples, but the kind of structure that have been solved in the last five years is just amazing. You open up any issue of nature, science, or cell, invariably you will find one of the cryogenic structures there, whether it be its lysosome, or whether it be some large assembly of different things, whether it be multiple complementation factors, or so on and so forth, all of them are actually flooding scientific literature at this moment, as we speak. And clearly, people have moved towards addressing much more complex problems than what we used to do earlier, solving structures of isolated proteins, like that. And this really has allowed, this particular technique has allowed uh, to address this uh, complex uh, problems in that region. The second development in computational ones is also a very exciting development that has happened. And many of you would have seen is that our ability to predict protein structures now. Now Google uh, came up with an algorithm uh, using deep learning. And uh, it says that given the sequence of a protein, we can now predict structure to resemble accuracy. All right, that's what Google now claims that with the algorithm called alpha four, and it is only one year old development, about a year, year and a half old development. And this has actually has a wave of excitement is passing through the world right now. All the biophysicists in the world are really excited with this particular development that we will be able to now predict the structure in our laboratories already, many of us. The next wave, of course, is can we predict now complexes, right? And the complexes, of course, if you start predicting multi-complex assembly of different biological assemblies, then we will be actually going clearly to the next step. But complexes, of course, are not static. Complexes form and complexes also disassemble. Complexes form only with certain triggers. Complexes actually disassemble with certain other, other triggers. All of this actually is a very tightly controlled process. And this is actually what we want to learn now. And if you start looking at whole cells now, I think the time has now come to go from the scale that I had shown you in the first slide, that how we move from the meter scale to millimeters, to micrometers, to nanometers, time has clearly come to start actually going up in that particular scale once again. So already we are starting moving from the nanometers to micrometers, and now micrometers to millimeters is what we're actually looking forward to moving using these new tools. There are the two new tools that have actually become available. One is the cryo-electron macroscopy, both tomography as well as single particle analysis. And the second, our ability to start actually predicting structures and assemblies and so on and so forth. So they're just amazing. And this is, I'm talking, I'm talking since post 1985, you know I mean? So it's not that long a period that over a period of hundred years, we have done this. And this entire period over from 1980 onwards till now, last 40 or 50 years, can really be actually defined as a renaissance or a similar period that physics was undergoing in about a century ago. About hundred years ago, what physics was undergoing with large excitement and every now and then there were actually different things that were happening in physics. The quantum physics itself was developing. The atomic physics was developing. We have exactly gone in biology through that era. 
and the era is not over yet and very often i keep telling audiences like this that i feel very envious of the people who are in their 20s or 30s like here in this audience i feel very envious of your generation because your generation is now going to witness the next revolution in biology you know when we started going from organismal level multi organismal level to organismal to cellular and molecular and now the time has actually taken us to go in the reverse direction you are going to be participating in that particular revolution in the understanding of biology in that so wish you all the very best for this and thank you very much now sir the talk is open for questions so we will start with students later we will move on we will start with plus one keep on moving Uh, my name is Nathan Singh Bakso. So I have I have question on membrane embedded portions. So if you can see the membrane embedded portions, these are hydrophobic in nature. So when we are putting testers, do we have to maintain this uh, environment? Yeah, yeah. So generally, what we do is uh, we dissolve them in uh, uh, detergents. So detergents, as you know, we have both uh, hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic uh, the same. And uh, detergents actually help us in forming a layer around the membrane which is hydrophobic. So for outside, they are polar, and therefore that can be then also uh, brought in the soluble water. So that time you can get the latent confirmation of the protein. That's right. Correct. That's and, what we do. And one more question, sir. So in majority of structures, so uh, some of the portions are missing because of lack of density. So how do we have to solve these uh, uh, portions? So lack of density is essentially because of the conformational heterogeneity that exists at that particular point of time. and as long as uh, at least in cryo microscopy if you have large number of images you may be able to capture some of the intermediates in that in crystallography what you get is a high temperature factor in that particular region but at times even that becomes difficult to see that particular region uh, uh, in the electron density map but we just assume that this is a very flexible region so uh, it cannot be stabilized easily that means like uh, especially this group group agency at times uh, the loops actually are highly flexible so to stabilize them then people use different techniques like addition of a ligand for example when is ligand bound then some of the loops can get stabilized or people use antibodies the antibodies can go and stabilize particular conformations of loops and so on so forth okay thanks uh, uh, thank you sir for the talk Uh, I have a very general question out of curiosity. Uh, which was the most difficult protein you came across to crystallize or to decode? Oh, God, God, there are quite a few actually. Many proteins have not crystallized in our hands. We have eventually given up. Apparently, if you look at the protein sequence or something, it doesn't look that it is very difficult to crystallize. But in the end, they don't crystallize. So crystallization is some sort of a heat and trial method. If it works, it works. If it does not work, it doesn't work. Membrane proteins are inherently more difficult to handle because of the solubility issues, and we have to try large number of detergents before we can really solubilize them. But there are techniques which are coming up these days which help us in doing that. For example, something called the nano rings and all, which form rings around the membranes and all. But uh, Many of these things are still evolving, but inherently membrane proteins are more difficult to handle than the, the soluble proteins. Thank you. Thank you. Under which conditions can one get the results of the testing which is showing confirmation transition so that the confirmation transition gets back into the results? So uh, it's very difficult to predict any of those uh, prior to crystallization. It is very very difficult to predict under what condition you will get crystals of those. Peptides are of course uh, the, the way of crystallizing is slightly more different than how we crystallize the protein. Fundamental principles remain the same, but nonetheless, I mean the solvents and all that we use are uh, different in peptides and proteins, something like that. But prior to crystallization, it's very difficult to predict what conditions would be suitable for crystallization. Thank you for the talk. Uh, thank you for enlightening the education of such a very. So I have a big question. You said that the geometry of the transmembrane protein will determine the entry of the ion, specific ion, specific ion. So, uh, 
How about the iron exchange? The same transport protein is uh, involved in exchange of uh, ions. Right? Sodium will enter and action with it. Okay. So how it is done? It is same for all the ions. No, no, no. So the, the structures of supporters and antiporters, what you're talking, are known in some of them. And the mechanism of some of them are also actually have been studied in quite some detail. And what I showed you an example is a single ion transporter. In this case, I showed you the potassium transporter. But uh, the supporters and antiporters, typically they are proton supporters, antiporters are known. But even ion supporters and antiporters are known. And their structure, some of them have been solved actually. And they use similar principles where the energy barrier is a maximum, that energy barrier is reduced by accumulation of charges and all at the center of the middle. Professor Raghavindra has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, the ion transport protein is involved in I am not working on channels directly, but you know, God sends with the result of the stomata of work. They have a beautiful system. They allow potassium intake under certain conditions to increase the pressure of the cell, the cell and not this open system at all. But when it is not needed, when they have to conserve water, the potassium ions are sent out. So we have a regulated mechanism of either influx or influx. What experts are saying, there are two different types of terms, potassium in and potassium out. And uh, I was wondering how we can integrate into the mechanism. So the whole the right kind of mechanism gets reworked. Right? No, so I think what you're saying is quite right. There is likely to be different mechanisms for importing and exporting because they're so highly spe specialized for functions that it's difficult to imagine that the same way if you just simply invert the channel would do the same thing as that you know i mean if you let us say just invert it flip it whether it would function the same way or not i don't think people have asked these questions uh, but what would be more believable would be two different mechanisms two different channels to one for importing and one for exporting and that would be probably regulated at genetic level at what stage you need the potassium in channels what they say they get activated when the membrane is hyperpolar. Potassium out channels, they get activated when the membrane is depolar. That, that's what they say. I mean, I really don't know the mechanism. But uh, most of the signals which do this job, they do hyperpolar or depolar. Right. You can do that with uh, more chemical. Right, right, right. I can imagine that, yeah. yeah. I think just to continue with that, I just, uh, as you said, but the reading is important. Why the inside will say? Uh, so here, when there is a core transport, okay, when the glucose is uh, core transporting by the molecule, then in that situation, uh, what is what exactly happens? Is it again the cell phase or the gating uh, of those core transporters? Or yeah, so gating mechanisms exist in almost all of them. If many of the importers, importers, antiporters, and all, all of them have gating mechanisms. So either they can get the ligand itself. Right, I mean, you have different kinds of gates, right? I mean, ligand mediated, voltage mediated, or whatever. Uh, or they can also get the uh, ion itself, the proton, or whatever. So, so uh, uh, you say that uh, they are uh, really the, uh, the charge gates, or what is being discussed, the uh, depolarization, depolarization, etc. But in practice, I mean, what I understood perhaps uh, that it is a membrane which is staying. So now I. Uh, in this case, it appears to be a membrane. In this case, what uh, Professor Raghavendra is mentioning is uh, hyperpolation or depolation of the membrane. That appears to actually act as some sort of a gate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, what we understood was in the neuro and muscle, in general sense, it's a membrane which is saying to the charge and then the in and out of the potential. But if the gating is done, Martha said that. Correct. Uh, okay. But there are also plenty of ligand gated channels. You know, the ligand decides whether something has to be brought in or taken out or whatever. You know? So, ligands also get the channels. Correct. 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 Now, also, there are other molecules like GABA and acetylcholine and all those things. They're also gated. So, uh, I was actually wondering for the uh, so called unstructured regions, right? Like, like the histone phase that you were showing, and many RNA by the proteins also. And uh, I was a student in this uh, the, the cryo electron microscope, the method that we are using. 
In that, you think you can track all the various structures that they uh, assume, the so called unstructured region? No, so cryo molecular mechanism, what we get is that uh, if there is a metastable conformation somewhere, then some particles will have that particular confinement at the loop. But inherently, if it's very disordered, then it would be difficult to actually capture millions of those things. Typically, the number of images that we collect would be of the order of a few hundred thousand or something. And eventually, we come down and average over a few tens of thousands of images. Now, a few tens of thousands of images to capture each possible confirmation of that disordered loop may not be possible. So generally, what are the uh, transiently stable confirmations of these loops? They can be in principle captured in crypto. Like for example, in the nuclear core complex, like right? inside they have these um, uh, the GLFG chains that have inside that have unstructured. So if, if you have like a um, sub complex, like two, three proteins, and then the un unstructured region of them pointing towards one side, or even for your nuclear zones, like the histones and unstructured phase. In those kind of uh, like when you have sub complexes, would it be easier to look at this? Uh, or get some structure for them, like to see how they. So, okay, um, in the nuclear pore complex, of course, the inner side, all these uh, tails, they actually form a jelly, right? I mean, so uh, it would be very difficult to uh, capture that. Even the membranes, right? Membranes, I mean, we show these are the classical structure, these are textbook structure. But I don't think anyone has really seen these tails like this. And if when people have done simulations using this, these, these tails are all over. I mean, they are flopping everywhere. I don't even have a stable confirmation in this thing. This is only a textbook imagination of how membrane would look. And it is purely imaginary, I mean, this kind of figure. And the same thing happens with the unstructured regions of proteins in different cases, what you mentioned. So, uh, about the latest prediction tool that uh, you talked about, like the structures like complex structures like protein complexes. Over a period of time, their uh, composition changed. So suppose we have the, we have uh, information about let us say that ten proteins that make this complex, and depending upon the uh, micro environment of that, one or the two uh, proteins they keep uh, changing in the complex because that dynamicity is uh, is has a, a reflection in the way let us say virus infects or virus overcomes the response of the cell. Is it also possible to have these kind of predictions if you have a set of protein which can interact, which change the microenvironment there, and then you know which proteins are falling off or not? At this stage, it's not mature enough to predict the very intricacies of complex formation and disassembly and all. At this point, the focus really is on if you know that this uh, the three proteins form a ternary complex. What would actually how they would be arranged with respect to each other or something like that? So focus essentially is actually in predicting how the complex assembly is there at this moment. But the macro conditions which make the complex formation or disformation possible, I don't think at this moment the focus is on that particular. Okay, but these conditions which are already no, no. The no, no. At this moment we don't know yet. Thank you. Yeah, so, so it's Sir, how will how uh, this company address the main dynamics of the proteins? Because these molecules are not uh, stationary, right? So they are having their proportions. So how we can address this dynamics, right? So because here we are getting the spectra. So basically, what they are seeing first, they are the photos, right? So first one, and then second question on these tools, sir. My question is this: How how you can comment on this accuracy? Like for an example, what we used to do, we used to model by homology modeling by lab board side chain a number of molecules. Then what we used to do, we used to compare this computer-generated model with a pretty similar structure, protein structure, whether it is from X-ray or NMR from the data bank. We used to compare these superimposed, and if the rate is coming within one or two arms, now we used to say that okay. This model looks a little bit decent. We used to run a lot of seconds analytics. And okay, now in the definition, these things are well better, and then there is no flashes. So we used to say that this model is pretty good. But then also, I mean, uh, from your expert, I mean, how will you comment on this accuracy of these tools? So, how we can tell, okay, this tool is like a mechanical or any observer or more homology modeling, backbone modeling, side chain modeling. How we can say that, okay, 
this is much better than the other one. So most of the tools that we use, with one, one, one more. Well, that's true where the this is as well, the second part of it. And the part of it is using a database. A database is like the same, like the same copy my own side. So okay, if you go some such as where some see there is a sequence that I read and okay, see and see that. There's a such a some beta sheet, some the details are there in the database, and we can easily form uh, uh, the strong reliability model from this type of it. But if there is something, nothing is there, new sequence, you can go back to something like more. So AlphaFold precisely does that. AlphaFold is not a homology modeling or a threading tool. AlphaFold is a completely de novo structure prediction tool. You know, and it uses deep learning to do that. And a large number of considerations have gone in allowing the computer to learn how proteins fold in a particular way. And with large number of examples, once the computer has learned that these are the basic principles of protein folding, AlphaFold actually makes a prediction. Alpha fold also gives you a level of confidence on a scale of zero to one, and typically we say that if you are in the point seven to point nine zone or more, then your predictions are likely to be right. They all ultimately probabilistic, and uh, with less than point four or point three, we say that the predictions are not likely to be that correct. So alpha fold is not really a homology modeling or a threading tool in that sense. It's a completely de novo structure prediction tool in that sense. Correct. So it's a completely different way, and the people actually are aware of that. Even Google doesn't claim that it does everything correctly at this particular stage. About the dynamicity, I mean, dynamicity is of course, I mean, exists in all biological systems, and uh, the, the number of different techniques uh, that can actually uh, help in the, uh, addressing the dynamic problem. NMR does to a particular extent. Uh, you see the peak broadening or uh, multiple structures which uh, satisfy the same constraints or whatever. So it actually also tells you how it is done. In cryotron microscopy, you will see if there are metastable confirmations, you will get to see them. In crystallography, you get a high temperature factor with that particular region. But to map every intermediate structure in that, it's not possible. Because, I mean, experimental techniques would actually look at a snapshot of each of those. And those snapshots are so transient that it's not the current experimental technique, technique don't allow to actually get a snapshot of that short lived uh, snapshot of the structure. That's not possible. Yeah. Let's go back. Sir, I mean, it's a general question for the APB structure. APB structure is not a complicated one. It's not a complicated one. It's not a complicated one. But, you know, even diaphragm uh, uh, microscopy also is not a complicated one. So, why is it because of the model? Because the model cannot be done to solve structure. So the last year, somebody actually reported a cryo structure of uh, one of the FZF and ATPs listing. Uh, I'm not sure whether how complete that structure is, whether all the components are there or not. But we can go look at that uh, cryo structure. And I'm not aware what are the difficulties in, in not having it a complete structure in that particular sense. But at least the basic structure of the uh, alpha, beta, C, and the shaft, that structure actually there are the cryo as well as uh, John Walker's. So, uh, two basic questions. So, uh, after all these high end modern techniques, what is the maximum resolution that you have achieved by any kind of construction? Oh, so uh, uh, by exact histography, the maximum resolution that people have observed is for a protein called Frambian. That resolution is about 0.5 angstrom per centimeter. It's a very, very high resolution. I mean, you can almost start seeing the electron density so, uh, orbitals that and all. Is there any specifics of why we end up having No, no, no. It's very difficult because it depends upon the quality of the crystals that you get. So, Krambin uh, was a favorable case in which, in my own lab, we had a structure of NRDH at 0 0.87 angstroms. So, but it's purely a property of the crystals, how they diffract. It cannot be predicted or it cannot be improved or in general. Uh, 
My next question is already is in the science nature of people. <laughs> but uh, like as the biologist, if we want to jump into the structure world, basically the modern tools such as uh, tomography, all these things, what are the possibilities we also jump into touching the science nature stuff? No, no. So uh, basically, uh, eventually, k k k more than science nature cell, it's more important that uh, the, the problem that you're addressing is a very fundamental problem or not, right? The choice of the problem is much more important than science nature or cell. And if the problem that you have chosen is a very frontline, very exciting problems or something, the world would probably accept it much better than others. So do we avoid all these uh, crystal problems and all those things with your tomography experiments right now you have shown? Well, oh, these are essentially very complementary techniques, crystallography and cryo-EM. Uh, cryo-EM is still not possible to do it for small molecules. For example, if I do lysozyme, I don't think I would be able to solve structure of lysozyme using cryo-EM because cryo-EM inherently looks at particles uh, which are sufficiently big in size. And cryo-EM also has now reached the resolution of about 2, 2.5 angstroms. So uh, in favorable cases. So uh, uh, we can consider them essentially as very complementary techniques to each other. Cryom allows you to uh, look at uh, very complex assemblies, multiple protein complex assemblies or something if they're metastable. And if I get them on the grid, the cryom actually allows you to do that and look at that. Well, crystals, uh, single crystals or complex binary or ternary complexes, crystals would be a preferred option. I have one other question. Uh, this is an in-between uh, interesting and serious issue of the object. Correct. So, what was the problem? I mean, it's not that, you know, not coming to the, you know, the scientists, I don't know. Uh, somehow, you know, it's not more becoming more, uh, I don't know, advantage for the, you know, official. No, so, fantasy is actually a completely different ballgame. What we do. They also, we don't need a picture. Can you no. So yeah, we can use crystals. So what happens, we actually take a snapshot of depression image. But because we're going to take a serial snapshot of the endosome, uh, uh, we have to collect as much data as possible in a single snapshot. See, generally what I showed you is we have to actually collect uh, the rotated crystal through a large angle. And it takes, this is about uh, five seconds to about a minute to collect the entire data. But for seconds, you have to make sure that you have to collect prefix snapshots. And what typically people do there then, therefore they don't use a monochromatic X-ray radiation, they use a polychromatic radiation. And because it's polychromatic, it can give you much more data than it can, a monochromatic radiation can give. But even in femtoseconds, you have to make sure that uh, the reaction is slowed down to that particular level, you know, and uh, um, what people do is they slow down the enzymatic reaction so that the subsequent rate is diffusing or whatever. We can get a real snapshot of that. People are also trying to develop, and not yet uh, very successfully, our X-ray lasers. Eventually, if X-ray lasers become available, then the femtosecond snapshots and all would become much more accessible. But at this moment, the development is still on. Question. Uh, question. Like, everyone knows that uh, the why I'm asking is in our biology, like I deliver the livestock, but many of the things that were to work on the human or mouse model that doesn't definitely the government to also find that in a basic biology looking into the biological bovine system and to a translation of work and the fast option that is kind of model. Yeah, I don't know how to answer this. There are probably some other people who would answer that better. But model organ, what happens is model organism, you have to understand ultimately it's a model, right? And I had attended one of the immunology talks. And after a beautiful talk, a very well known person, at the end, the conclusion was mouse is not a man. So, I mean, I said, I mean, after all this. So, right. so uh, the complexities of every organism are so different. But what we try to generalize is that different organisms have very different similar principles. And therefore, if you understand organisms which is easy to handle and try to generalize that conclusion to the larger. Uh, organism, it might be generally true or something. And that's why people study the organisms, different model organisms that way. But we have to understand that every organism has its own complexities and might have its own uniqueness that may not be possible to do uh, generalize so easily. And that's the difficulty that we get. I mean, I don't know whether uh, Professor Parao or Professor Ravindra would agree with this. Or Subir. No, that's true. I mean, now, models now are 
not being specified for smaller groups and different groups. So, like for C4, we have a model on the other. C3, we have a paradox to send you. And then MOS, we also have a model on the other. material like for this. So, now instead of one, like in plants, now there are half a dozen. Correct. Even otherwise, I mean, serigans use it essentially for cell cycle or something like that, right? And then if you want to use uh, for uh, property weight development, you go to zebra fish or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. I did not generalize that. It yeah. helps us to understand the broad kind of things. Correct. Specifics are always yeah. 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 Excellent, Dr. Sir, my question is, as you said, even in the last right now we have seen a long from uh, last 1980s and now we have made a lot of advancement in the survey biology and my question is related to COVID so in 2020 we got to know the receptor and we know how the virus is entering into it but still if we see 2020 first wave 2021 second wave a lot of different medicines they use and then afterwards it has affected the fact that you know these things actually doesn't work on the system so after prediction all these things, uh, we are not able to predict whether this is the actual target for this. Right. No, no, so the target is known. So the way a virus enters the cell, that of course I think is very well understood now, that it uses is 2 receptor, it uses TMPRS2 and all. Uh, so those things of at least the viral entry and replication is maturation in the cell and all, are I think uh, are understood to a much better clarity now than now. Now, as far as the therapeutics are concerned, vaccines are of course already in the market. The vaccines actually boost our immunity so that we don't get infected. But uh, for uh, the therapeutics, uh, chemicals, it's a very complex process itself by itself. So there aren't really very effective molecules in the market yet that if you come out to be positive, you have to start eating the medicine, then you will get clear of that. Although Pfizer has brought a molecule now, which is a protease inhibitor that is in the market now in the Western countries. But uh, still, uh, therapeutics are being developed all around the world. And development of therapeutic itself is a very, very complicated process. I don't think we can very easily generalize saying that we know the disease and we know how the virus enters the cells, we know how it uh, replicates in the cells and all. And therefore, therapeutics will be very easy to uh, evolve. But it's not the case. Thank you. No, no, the diffraction comes because the molecules are arranged periodically in a lattice. There's a basic of diffraction. Now in proteins, the assumption is that every protein is identical to another protein molecule and the relative positions of atoms are exactly identical. By and large, this assumption is true. Right? I mean, by and large, the assumption that two different molecules of the same protein look identical to each other. There could be minor differences that the few atoms here and there might be positioned differently in two different molecules. That's where the deviations from these assumptions come. But by and large, what I said, is that two molecules have identical positions of atoms within the molecules, is that assumption is by and large right. And the diffraction comes when you actually put millions of these molecules together in a lattice, in a periodic lattice. But they're all, that's what I mean, that's what order essentially means that all the atoms are in identical position in different molecules. That's so the order. Some regions of proteins may not have an order. They could be disordered. But it's different. So those we don't anyway see in the structure, the disordered regions. Yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, first of all, sir, when you ask sector whether how we do and touch those journals, you can start from reverse, sir. You start from the structures which are solved and find out that in the way you work and your problems, whether some of them that you they are by institutions, and take one of those. Good new structures and start working in your own system in this journey, then it will be good. And secondly, second, as in case of genes, we have already seen that there are a lot of transgenic plans made. We, we I myself, as a lot of transgenic animal models of human diseases with 
Sonny and uh, so many other people. And we kept on publishing good papers and we went up to the biology. In case of structures, I have seen Dr. Dinkar when I joined Britain and joined the NII. See, he used to do solve certain things and I have two papers with him on a structural biology. I mean, I'm not a structural biology, but he took my help for the biological experiments using mice. And also Shankar does it so nicely in CCMB. So like we have the transgenic centers and we immediately know about a gene and immediately start uh, doing a model in uh, animals and do something. Uh, are there places where these uh, very nicely upcoming structures are handled for biological activities or inventions in up to the animal model within the country are the places? So the structure and biology groups are plenty. People who actually can solve the structures competently there are quite a few of them, there are at least 40-50 uh, different groups in the country. The facilities uh, to generate those are now coming up all across. So DST in fact recently gave a major grant of generating four such facilities, one to IIT Mumbai, one to IIT Kanpur, one to Bose Institute, like that. So DST has been supporting uh, generation of the facilities where you can take your material, collect data, come back and solve the structure. So those kind of facilities are available. And the facilities also to produce protein and all, I mean, they're also there, but these days most of the people can do it in their own labs. But what I understand, this whole structural biology group in our country at this point of time is geared up to know the basic mechanisms of various things, how, what binds where and does what. But then as we were talking that if we can go to a mammalian model, for example, which for human or in plant model, and really do the experiments to show that what we predicted and what we did, it's binding exactly the same manner. And at the end of the day, affecting the same function successfully. I'm sure for hydrated channels that a lot of work is done, but for new structures. So do we have a combination of group of people who are together and work together like that? Oh, there are quite a few examples of people actually working together in the country. I mean, people who are addressing some very good biological problems. I mean, the collaboration between Rajesh, Jivashish and Shankar itself is a very good example of that that uh, the, the biological problems were identified by Rajesh in the complex uh, uh, lipid generations or uh, non ribosomal appropriate synthesis and all, and Shankar and uh, Devayush were helping him solving those problems. But those kind of examples actually are coming up uh, quite well. So, yeah, that's a very good example. Mm -hmm. very good. That's a good idea. You are in Hyderabad. There are people, you collaborate and when you discuss ideas come yeah. and what you can do or how we can help you. For example, Shankar and in Hyderabad. So this is to start talk on a cup of coffee without knowing anything. Probably you will read somewhere. Very exciting talk. I have a question on this um, uh, petrium and sodium injury. So uh, I did say that there's no uh, diffusion, but say, because the secondary of the ions are tightly regulated. So, uh, is it true for all the ions, no diffusion at all happens, or uh, the exception, or uh, in certain circumstances, some diffusion may happen, to say, uh, if there's a huge um, high concentration in the extracellular matrix, then under those circumstances, some of the ions can be taken in by simple diffusion, because of the site regulation. So normally, the diffusion across membranes is very, very difficult, even as you know, for even for water, if you have to transport water, you need aquaporins. You know? So, uh, so diffusion across membranes is an extremely difficult thing to get anything across the membranes, and you do need specialized machinery for that, including for ions. But there are specific ion channels, as we talked about chloride, sodium, potassium. Uh, but there are certain things which are ion channels can also be a bit non-specific, so that the same channel can also have potassium. But examples are those are fewer than the specific ones, the ones that actually cut off uh, the, 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 the iron specific scheme. Correct. Mm. Yeah. 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 Correct. So there are examples of both kinds are known. But 
the examples of very specific channels are actually more in literature than examples of the ones which are non specific we have also now, sir uh, i i like to comment on later No, so deviations are always part of uh, experimental inaccuracies, and people are aware of what kind of inaccuracies to expect. You know? So, if you look at, for example, protein data bank, which is the repository of all the salt structures till now, by NMR or crystallography or even cryo now, and uh, look at uh, certain structures that have been very highly populated. If you could do a search for HIV protease in protein data bank, you will see large number of structures of HIV proteases, salt under multiple different conditions. With different ligands, different mutations, and so on and so forth. And if you overlay HIV protease structures in all of them, they are more or less identical. Now, when we say identical, we define the statistical limit of accuracy. And typically, when you are able to superpose, uh, say about 80% or 90% of the atoms in the two structure, to a better than something like 0.2 or 0.3 angstrom root mean square deviation, we generally say that they are identical. You know, so the RMSD. Should not be very high between two structures. If it happens to be three angstroms, four angstroms, then obviously, I mean, the structures have been very inaccurate. So, for example, we can talk about two structures. Yeah, but that's a drawback of the docking algorithms. Yeah. The docking algorithms are still not that well evolved on today's day. So, the docking, for example, if you do, you cannot uh, say with reasonable accuracy that what is going to be the bending affinity of that particular molecule with the ligand or whether the bending mode predicted by the docking is really the bending mode that would be there in the time so there's the difficulty with the docking algorithms as of now we have not understood the chemistry of docking really to the same depth as what we have understood to the structures themselves yes, the order dilemma to select the section for the only more than one yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, i had i came uh, across a lot of studies and I, when i replicated like i didn't get like Huh. In fact, if you could take two different docking algorithms and try that, they will they quite likely will give you two different results. Sir, uh, one more question because you are already in this business. So, have you compared like a like a before starting the wet uh, lab and uh, you made the model and see the uh, uh, similarity of the like, computational model as well as like a uh, experimental model? Like so, we haven't tried that uh, ourselves. There's a Worldwide competition that happens every year, something called CASP. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there they do. I mean, they deposit structures ahead of time and ask uh, all the predictors around the world that go ahead and predict these structures. And this comparison is then made in the background, and uh, people who are predicting the best, the results are then announced, saying that this uh, people have predicted the structures the best or something like that. But we don't do it in our lab. Those kind of exercises. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, a lot of questions, but uh, we we'll wind up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There were some lot of comments and improvement also we have. Most of them were thank you. So uh, now I have the first uh, I to take uh, take it. Uh, Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you.
Now I request uh, Dr. Goel to wind off the program with vote of thanks. Uh, it gives me an immense pleasure and uh, makes me a lot of emotional to give these votes of thanks because uh, I have been associated with Dr. Lalji Singh for 10 years. He was the hiring director in 2000 when I joined CCMB. And I remember the first day when I interacted with him, uh, it was customary for him when uh, you joined CCMB that he would uh, uh, himself escort you to the sitting place and uh, make you sit there and uh, assure that you're comfortable you know so i remember uh, most of you would remember dr lalji singh as institutional institution builder and leader but i remember him as a very uh, supportive colleague uh, explosively angry sometimes you know and uh, but always encouraging you know he has been very encouraging director Anyways, uh, coming to the vote of thanks, uh, the scientific event organization committee would uh, like to thank our director uh, uh, and uh, for making this event possible and also thank our chief guest, uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande, sir, for his wonderful scientific talk and igniting the, the idea of structural biology among the students and the, the faculty that they would come up with some noble uh, research programs to, you know, uh, come up with high impact factor paper as uh, Dr. Prasad said, and I also like to thank the whole of the NIB and the, the staff for making this possible. I would also like to thank our formal director for initiating this, uh, Dr. Sudhi Mujidna sir, for initiating this uh, lecture series, and there's a second one of that series. And I would also like to uh, thank all the distinguished uh, guests here who has come from HCU and other places. And uh, thank you very much. And to all the student and staff and uh, uh, and the faculty here, and thank you very much uh, for this, uh, your, your presence here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So now we have the outside uh, tea and coffee, you can have a cup of tea and snacks. So I would request our guests also, uh, the company, so that we can have interaction, we can interact with the Thank <laughs> you.